Resilience is something that actually has always been in the American DNA. That capacity to withstand adversity, to bounce back from it better and stronger when it happens, is a core American trait. I was stationed in Hawaii at the time, so I was a major, and it was 6 o'clock in California. It was 3 o'clock in Hawaii, 3 o'clock in the morning. My best friend called me, said, turn on the TV, and I'm like, what channel? And he says, doesn't matter. I was still asleep, and everything was still going on. I'm from California, so three hours difference. I would think it was like 6 o'clock in the morning for me. Um, so my mom came wake me up. She's like, you won't believe this. I do remember where I was on 9-11 because uh, I was at Camp Pendleton at the time. I believe I was in the sixth grade. Uh, my mom just recently joined the uh, Air Force. I remember I was in high school and um, it was panic. Our math teacher actually um, was walking down the hall and she was crying. I wasn't too sure what was going on. We heard that uh, one of the buildings was hit. I remember getting the TV on just in time to see the second World Trade Center. Um, you know, see the plane fly into the second World Trade Center. And I, you know, didn't know anyone in the towers, but knew as a reserve officer that my life was going to be changed um, from that, that point on. So on the night of uh, September 11th, I put my uh, resume together, got my old military records together. And then on the morning of September 12th, uh, uh, contacted a local army recruiter. After 9-11, I wanted to be on the ground, I wanted to be over there, I wanted to be fighting the fight. As soon as I was able to know exactly what it meant, I wanted to join. I said to myself, I was like, you know, I need to do something. I'm gonna serve my country. So I went to Yonkers, I went to the depot over there, and I, I signed up, and a week later I was gone. I'm comfortable in saying that I didn't think about being wounded. And in any of my deployments, I thought about the fact that I might not come home, or I thought about coming home, and I didn't think about anything in between. Our outpost got attacked that day. I was 20 feet from the door when the RPG hit the wall near me, and it went through, and it was at, it was loud. Uh, I just remember just, you know, deafening, you know, blast, and uh, and I thought it hit the tower that was uh, probably 30 feet from me. And I looked up, you know, I didn't see any smoke or anything, and. Um, then I kind of looked down, and uh, my whole right side was covered in blood. And my squad leader, I heard him yell, um, you know, doc shit. And he grabbed my arm, and, uh, and he squeezed around up high. And when he raised it, my hand hit me in the face. And, um, and you know, and I kind of looked, and then I grabbed my arm, and then the ACUs had fallen off. And, um, and I could see basically down my forearm um, because uh, both bones were blown out, and then everything on the top, it was... Uh, comparison, you know, it looked like a shark bite. We got the word that uh, our uh, snipers and our, our friendly forces were under some pretty heavy fire. We positioned ourselves in between our forces and the enemy fire. Um, and, you know, in the luxury of a 69-ton M1A1 Abrams tank, you can do that. I had a light armored vehicle that came right in between us and the enemy forces. So I tried to get a hold of them for everything I could, uh, you know, yelling over the radio, Warlord, this is Tiger, Warlord, this is Tiger. And I couldn't raise them. So uh, I did uh, what the Marine training taught me to do, secondary means of communication. I popped up out of the top of the tank and uh, gave kind of the cutthroat signal to not go down there. And, and it was about that time where I was struck with a single round through the arm, uh, entered uh, from my tricep, through my bicep, and into my chest. And it spun me around about 90 degrees. And I remember thinking, well, what was that? You know, it, it was an amazing impact. I stuck my right arm underneath my left armpit to kind of get that pressure point there and, and slow down the bleeding, and I, and I was. But I was trying to move my arm to get down inside the tank, and I didn't realize that, that my arm was shattered. We were on a dismounted patrol that night. Uh, one of our other platoons um, started getting shot at, and we had never found any IEDs in a field. They've always been on a path or in a choke point, something that leads you into that place where they know you're going to have to hit the ID if you walk in there. And I remember feeling a lifting feeling, and uh, it went black. But I never, I couldn't feel anything, couldn't hear anything, couldn't see anything. But uh, I could talk to myself, so I, I said, um, I said, I guess this is what death feels like. You can talk to yourself, but you can't see anything. I remember saying, that sucks, you know? I was like, I can't believe I'm dead. I would have died. I was shot behind the ear by an enemy sniper who was very good. The Marines around me thought I was dead. The Corpsman Grant came over and performed an emergency tracheotomy on me, cut out my throat so I wouldn't drown in my own blood, put some tubes down my nose, and also performed rescue breathing because I was dying. He did that even though the sniper was still shooting at the Marines and all those around us. So 
it was complete disregard for his own safety. He saved my life. I had lost so much blood that they had to resuscitate me uh, on the OR table um, because they, uh, once they took me into surgery, um, they had once they released the tourniquets, it started bleeding out of control again. I wasn't hooked up to blood yet, and I lost so much that they had to resuscitate me and you know give me uh, the electric paddle or whatever you know. And um, the surgeon, you know, they were doing stuff. And I was still, you know, kind of in and out of it. And she saw me playing with my hand. And she saw uh, these three fingers moving, uh, my uh, middle finger, ring finger, and pinky. And um, it's controlled by the ulna nerve. And that's the only nerve in my arm that wasn't damaged at all. So I could still move it, even though, you know, pretty much my arm was gone. Um, you know, if you could cut it off with a pair of scissors. My eyes started flickering open and uh, started coming to. I knew I hadn't been out that long because there was still a lot of dust in the air and uh, some of my soldiers were still on the ground trying to get up from the blast. And I remember coming to was first, um, and I was yelling for help. Or well, first I was you know, screaming because I couldn't believe, you know, damn, I just lost my legs. It was pretty much like they just got cut right up from under me. I was laying in the crater. Uh, I could see my legs. I could see the bone, uh, probably about six inches of the bone in my right leg sticking out. My squad leader, yeah, when I was yelling out for help, he's like, who is that? And I, was like, I said, quink, and he started crawling towards me. Um, he was so shaken up, he was trying to put a tourniquet on my leg. First he asked me where my tourniquet was. We carried one in our IFAC, which is our medical pouch uh, on our equipment, and then one in the pant leg of our, pocket, of our pants. And he was like, where's your, where's your tourniquet? And I was like, wherever my leg is. And I never felt any pain, and I wanted to watch everything. But I stayed awake the whole time. Uh, we flew to Kandahar, uh, landed there, and they got me off the, the bird, and they were talking to me. I remember being just like frantic, like covered in people. I sat up, kind of, it was like, don't let me die, and then I went out. So as much as I tried to move my arm, the only thing that was moving was my elbow. And my arm was caught up on the top of the tank. And I thought, Phew. and I looked over and I, I looked at my load and I said, I can't. So I went back over to try and fix my arm, trying to grab my arm. And as I grabbed my left arm with my right hand, another hand grabbed my arm. It kind of freaked me out at first. I thought, whose hand is that? And I followed the arm up and I looked. That's Corporal Jared Malone. He had jumped out of the safety of the tank, onto the tank, in, in enemy fire, in the line of fire, and grabbed my arm to dislodge it. And I, within a matter of minutes, probably 20 to 30 minutes after I was struck by that bullet, I was getting on board a medevac helicopter and being rushed into my first surgery. I went to an aid station there, and then several hospitals in Iraq, and then to Lansfield, Germany, and then finally to Bethesda. And every stop of the way, a team of, a team of military folks did exactly what they were supposed to do to save me. At any one of those places, I could have died, and no one would have faulted them because my injury was, you know, pretty catastrophic. Every time you get a chance to put a uniform on and be with these kids, I think it makes you want to be a better person and work that much harder. The medical community um, in the military right now, uh, particularly on the battlefield, is a compilation of all services and of all, all branches in that you've got Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines on the battlefield, as well as I suspect some Coast Guard. And then amongst those components, you have National Guard Reserve and active component units that um, have all mobilized. As an emergency physician in theater, uh, I've found it to really be the best job an emergency physician could have. We're taking care of uh, men and women who are doing an extremely hard job. They do it without complaining. So the medevac is the beginning of a pipeline where a uh, warrior is wounded in the field, medevac to a treatment facility, and then on to Longstuhl, and then all the way back to the States. That process used to take months. It was reduced to weeks, now we've got it down to days. And I'm very, very proud to say that uh, I help provide care for wounded warriors, our nation's sons and daughters that uh, defend this country so bravely. The general Marines are just short of incredible. I mean, these we've had guys come in and they've got below the knee amputations and they're like, um, you know, just look at you and they'll say, I'm doing well, how are you today? And, that's, and that just still blows me away. So thank God for the Marines. I worked in their ICU in the Rural 3 in Kandahar Hospital. Um, these, the, the six months I was there, in, uh, only in the ICU, um, took care of, of all of our men who were um, blown up, shot at, um, everything and anything. I think they're the bravest people 
in the world. I can't believe how kind and polite they are. They can have their legs blown off and they're saying, yes, ma'am. Just blew my mind how great they are and how awesome they are. They're absolutely the, the greatest that we have here. Um, it was an honor to take care of them and uh, hopefully give them some comfort and hopefully help save their lives. I've had 39 surgeries. I had 36 from June 15th, 2010 to uh, I think the end of September was the last one, inpatient, 36. And then I've had three since, and I got one left. And then I think that's it. Now the first surgeries, obviously, they did were to keep my arm. You know, they're taking some stuff that works from other parts of my body and putting them in. They said it's basically like splicing wire, kind of. And then they had to figure out how to close it. Um, like I was saying, you know, such a deep wound that they did the flap. And, uh, you know, like I said, they cut three sides, raised it up, and then sewed my arm to my side or whatever, like this. And it was like that for 30 days. The first two weeks, 10 days, two weeks, the blood flowed with my chest still, the skin. And then after about two weeks, it switched. It basically started grabbing all. And like if I raise my wrist, kind of, you can see it moving. There's actually like muscle underneath there now. I came back in 2005. I was hit in February of 05. And I came back uh, March of 05 and realized that there was something wrong with the right side of my head and my, my eye. So I went through about six surgeries and then finally November of 05, they had no choice but to remove the right eyeball. I never thought about my personal freedom the way I thought about it after I first got wounded. And you talk about freedom to go to the bathroom, freedom to go to the store. I mean, freedom just to do things you're, that you used to be able to do. Everybody was gone, um, you know, uh, fairly late in the night and um, you know, well, hospital was pretty quiet around that time, and the only person with me was my wife, who was with me for, you know, ever. Uh, she was sleeping in the chair beside me for the first four weeks of surgeries, and uh, God bless her. Uh, but she was there, and she was sitting in the chair beside me, and all I can remember thinking was, that's serious. I won't need my golf clubs anymore. And I thought to myself, whoa, what else? What else can't I do now? So now I can't rotate. I can rotate at the shoulder, but like I can't, like if you wanted to hand me something, you know, I can't do any of that. And then, you know, just from the anatomy of my arm now, you know, my wrist, I can't raise it back. You know, just the nerve damage and stuff to my uh, fingers, you know, this is my fist, you know, I can't bend. The last surgery, they cut the muscle on this side of my palm out right there. So now I can't open my uh, pinky, but, uh. It draws my thumb out to where I can, you know, grab stuff now more uh, or easier. So they're just trying to make it now. It's just about getting as functional as possible. I think one thing with this is you can, you can let yourself fall into a trap of, you know, pity with these kind of injuries because they're so debilitating. If you don't want to push yourself to get better, you're not going to get better. My goal that I've put out is I want to get independent by the end of December being able to walk, being able to take care of myself. My first goal uh, is, it's kind of, it's really, really sentimental and it, it, it kind of hits me in the heart a lot. And I mean, just like playing with my son, I know once he gets older, it's gonna be hard for me to move around on the floor a lot and kind of follow him around. But the main thing right now is actually carrying him. Um, we got this, uh, what is it, baby bonjour thing? It's a little uh, carrier. Um, right now what we do in therapy is uh, we put weights in it to uh, kind of resemble the weight of my son right now. And I walk around to work on my balance because the weight score is gonna pull me forward. But if I learn how to uh, counterbalance that, then eventually I can be able to put my son in and carry him. I know that I would not have had a successful recovery as I have without Jolly there. It's just, Knowing, even when I was in a coma, even when I couldn't move, but knowing that she was there, and also my other family members too, because they live close by, knowing that they were there just really helped me remain calm and know that I'm gonna get better. I have people who love me around me. The one thing I can tell our wounded warriors is the road ahead is long, the recovery is not quick, but there's a whole bunch of people who are in your corner, whether you know it or not, and you, you have an obligation to yourself to get the help that you need. 
people come into my uh, into my room, you know, Wounded Warrior Project, and, and their partnership with Disabled Sports USA, and and said, hey, we're gonna we're gonna get you out, we're gonna get you golfing again, and I thought, yeah, um, have you seen my arm? I, you know, just I have one arm, really, basically, and they said, no, 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 you don't have one arm. We have guys that have one arm. We have guys that have one leg. We have guys that have no legs. They're out there. We got this. And I thought, well, I mean, maybe if they can do it, I'll try it. And so here I am six years later, that that, that one, one time, that one event, that one partnership, that one organization that got me out there to try it changed my life. One of the plastic surgeons that helped on one of the surgeries was like, yeah, you know, we'll do some plastic surgery and we'll, we'll fix some of those up. And I was like, why? And he's like, you know, that way they don't show up. I was like, you're crazy. I was like, I want them to show up. You know, I was like, this, I was like, this, this is paid for in full. Because the worst is over, the best is yet to come. It's understanding this new normal, it's accepting this new normal, and not as a curse or something or a punishment or something bad has happened to you, but it's really as an obstacle in life that that you've got to overcome. People ask, you know, how do you, how can you come to work and see this every day? And 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 the answer is, it's honestly, it's very easy. And part of it is because people make progress every single day. The soldier ride was a, a good point for me because it showed me where I was physically and not only that, but emotionally because I got to go to the uh, ground zero to the Freedom Child. And that's something I've always wanted to do. And it made me think about where I really am in my therapy and uh, seeing that I'm riding with other Marines, I'm interacting with other Marines, and I don't have a problem with it. I don't, I don't, um, I feel comfortable, I feel normal. I could have been all done. I mean, I almost died there. I was minutes away from dying that night. I feel like I've been handed a baton, and I have to take that and run with it. And how am I doing that? I can talk about it. I'm okay talking about what's happened to me. So my goal, my, my endeavor in life is to, is to be a, a good father a good husband, and use what I've been given, and I truly think that, boy, I, it was a blessing, uh, to use that, and, and however I can, to help those who come after me. One of the big things we learn in the military is, whatever you do, you make it better for the guys behind you, and, and I, I'm doing that. I went through three years of depression, of not doing anything, and I just made a promise to myself when I came out of the depression and started working with warriors that I wasn't going to let anyone go through what I went through. And that's my mission. That's all I'm looking to accomplish. I don't want to heal the world. I just want to stick some band-aids here and there, and I think I'll be happy with that. Right now I'm applying through the VA's vocational rehab program to go to grad school in national security because I think I have a definite future there. I'm definitely excited about the road for it. I'll never forget that. You know, I probably shouldn't have made it off that battlefield. So every day is a good day for me. My mom always said, you, no one can take away your education. You know, I went to West Point, got the education. I feel like I can do whatever I want to do. But uh, having my wife and having my dogs, that's what makes up my family right now. You know, I could live with that forever. I'm going to grow up, and my son's going to grow up, to know that I've accomplished something. And then not on top of that, but how strong I am to push myself through everything. The next chapter of your life really does start here. You know, your life's not over. Sure, it's different. It's never going to be the same. But, uh, you know, it's not over no matter what. No matter what's wrong with you, what happened, or whatever. There's, there's something for everybody out there. You don't have to be running a marathon. You don't have to be climbing a mountain. It's, it's about where you are right now and making the most and the best that you can. You know, we're not machines. We're human. And part of, uh, part of living this life is, I think, first to recognize when we fall short, recognize that we can do better, and then really understanding that, and then being willing to try harder, to try better, to, to, to live up to the moment, to stay in the moment, and, um, and be the best we can.